Thank you for joining us for this week's message at Crosswind Church. If you have any questions about this message or about Crosswind Church, please visit us at www.crosswindchurch.net or you can email us at info at crosswindchurch.net. And they can sing a little bit, can't they? Good night. Wow. Praise God for that. Um, you know, uh, I wanted to, to talk with you just a little bit before we dive into Scripture, um, just about music. Uh, it, it, music is kind of so important in our lives. I don't know that we even kind of realize just exactly the extent that, that it plays in some of our lives. And I want to ask you, I want you to think back with me, if you will. Have you had those moments in your life where, where when you think back on those moments, maybe milestones in your life, where, uh, where like there's a particular song that immediately comes to mind because that song meant something to you at that particular time. Maybe it was like when you got married, you know, and it was the song. It's almost never the song you walk down the aisle to, but it's the song that you recessed to, like headed to the party. Uh, or maybe it's the song that you danced with brides. It's the, the song you danced with your daddy at the first dance or the first dance you had with your groom or something along those lines. That song just kind of comes to mind. Or, or, or maybe it, it's not your wedding. Maybe it's like your senior year of high school. Right, that year where you're getting ready to finish one milestone, move into another phase of life, the future is right before you, and and almost always there's a group of songs or a song that just kind of comes to mind. Maybe when you start thinking about your senior, some of you that are in your senior year, you're living that right now. I'm gonna date myself just a little bit and go back because when I think about my senior year, there's definitely some songs that come to mind. There's definitely some songs. Uh, the first song that comes to mind is not even a song that I like. In fact, I don't even like this song, but it was on the radio all the time. It was ubiquitous uh, in the mid-90s. In fact, it was a remake of a song that came out in the mid-70s, and it was uh, December 1963 was the name of the song, and then parentheses, Oh, What a Night. You remember, Oh, What a Night. Hated that song. But when I think about my senior year, that was always what was on the radio. Like, there was no getting away from it. There were songs, however, that I liked. And in fact, one song that I think about with my senior year was a song by the name of Coolio. He, Coolio did the song, right? He's the artist. Maybe you know Coolio. If you don't know Coolio, that's okay. That's right. At one point in time, I'm not proud of this at all. At one point in time, my girlfriend was going through my CDs. That's what we had before MP3. And she said, my boyfriend owns both Coolio albums. That was what she said. And I was embarrassed by that then, and I'm more embarrassed by that now. But I did. Anyway, regardless, he sang a song that came out uh, right around my senior year uh, called Fantastic Voyage. You know, that come along and ride on a fantastic slide, slide. All right, anyway, sorry. Uh, got, got, a little, got a little distracted there. And, and, and then th th there, there's also a song that goes with my spring break my senior year. Because a group of us went down to Florida for spring break uh, my senior year. And, and this was the song that, that we learned. It was by an artist who was 6'8", and, and he said he was 6'8", in the song. His name was Montel Jordan, and this is how we do it. You know that guy, right? That was one of those songs that kind of, in fact, if you want to just kind of, I just want to geek out on you just a minute. Back in October, uh, our staff went to a conference in Atlanta called Catalyst, and our first day, we're sitting there, me and, and Hunter and Matt and Courtney, we're sitting there in, in the waiting on worship to start, and out on the stage walks, I'm not making this up, Montel Jordan. See, he loves Jesus now, and he's leading worship at a church, and they brought him in to lead worship for Catalyst, and I geeked out just a little bit because that's how you do it. Anyway, regardless of that, those are the songs that kind of that kind of just kind of, when I think about my senior year, these and other songs like it just kind of come to mind. And, and, you know, I bet it's that way for you too. I bet that when you think about these milestones, the birth of a child or move to a new city or a vacation that was so meaningful, there's a song or a group of songs that kind of comes to mind. I, I'm going to give you a quote. It's, a, it's attributed to Plato, although there's question about whether or not he actually said it. He says this. He says, music gives soul to the universe, wings to the mind, and flight to the imagination. I mean, that's so incredibly true, isn't it? That, that without music, think about this, without music, your scary movies wouldn't be as scary. If you take the music they're playing out, man, Wes Craven doesn't even have a career. You with me? Like, the music is what makes it. If you didn't have music, you wouldn't know what to do when you broke up with your boyfriend in high school, would you? Because the music is what told you today. It just talks right to your soul. It, it just sparks something inside of your head. In fact, your life and my life, whether we like it or not, has a, a little soundtrack, doesn't it? I thought often, it would probably get on my nerves eventually, but I thought, man, how cool would it be if my life really had a soundtrack, like in movies, you know? Like, 
as I'm driving down the road, the song that just kind of grabs the emotion I'm feeling and what I'm feeling in my mind just kind of plays in the background, you know? Something along those lines. Maybe you thought that. Maybe I'm the only weird one that's about it. But, but, but music plays an important part of our life. It tells the story to some degree of our life. And so we shouldn't be surprised when we start reading the story of Scripture that, that there's songs all throughout it. We shouldn't be surprised that, that when we come to a milestone or event in Scripture that, that almost always there's a, a song that's associated with it. Theologians have said that Scripture is just one big meta-narrative, one big story that's punctuated by songs. Think about it. You know, those of you that grew up in church, that read the Bible, when, it, when Adam receives Eve as his wife, he sings. When Hannah finally gives birth to a baby boy after years and years and years of waiting, sings. When the Israelites cross the Red Sea and watch the Egyptians drown behind them, they, they sing. David, the shepherd king, his entire story is just punctuated with song and music. I mean, we have an entire book in the Old Testament that has 150 different songs in it right in the middle of our Bible. So we ought not be shocked when we come to the story of Jesus and we see that, that this story of the birth of a king, the birth of a savior, is, is just punctuated with music and song. It's everywhere you look. You can't help but find it. So this Christmas season, if you, you, you're new to Crosswind, what we decided to do is we thought we would tell the Christmas story this year, but we would do it a little differently. We would tell the Christmas story as it's told through the songs that are associated with Christmas. Last week we talked about Zechariah a man whose son would become John the Baptist, and how he responded to God's gift of a son. This week we're going to look at a young lady by the name of Mary and the words that come out of her mouth as she realizes what it is that God is doing for her. Now, we don't have a shortage of babies at Crossman. We don't. In fact, we just built a whole building back there just to house your babies, right? That's it. And we rigged up cameras so that people that are watching your babies can watch us on the screen right now. They're, they're watching in there, I promise. Okay, so, so, so here's, the, here's the thing. We understand what it's like to have babies all around us. And if you've ever had a child, you remember, I bet, that moment that you held your kid for the first time in your arms. And it, it, I don't know if you're like me, but if you feel like me, there's all kinds of thoughts and emotions that go through, whether it's your first child or your second child, or whether you have annual children like the Rices and the Crossins, I don't know. Right? Regardless of what it is, regardless of what it is, when you're holding that baby, right, when you're holding that baby, you begin to think and wonder, what is it? What is it that, that this baby is going to do? What is it this baby's going to be? Is she going to be the president of the United States? Is, is he going to run a corporation? Is she going to find a godly man to partner with? How is she going to grow up and what kind of girl? And last week I challenged us by saying, quoting Andy Stanley. And Andy Stanley says this. He says, and perhaps your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God is not something you do, but someone you raise. And that, that should challenge every single one of us. But as we dive into Mary's story, what I want to ask you today is this. What would you do? How would you respond? You knew that your little baby was going to be the Savior. What would you do if you knew that the baby that you're going to hold in your arms, that baby that you're going to carry with you for nine months, that baby was sent by God? How would you respond? Today we get to see how Mary responded. So if you have your Bibles, you may want to follow along in Luke chapter 1. Now, before you get there, I want to tell you a little bit about Mary. So as you're turning to Luke 1, let me tell you a little bit about her. She was incredibly young by today's standards to have a baby or to be married. She was somewhere between 12 and 14 years old. We'll just kind of average that out and say 13, okay? So, so to give you perspective on how young that is, let me do two things. Number one, how many of you have ever been 13 at one point in time? Okay, what in the world were you doing at 13? Don't answer that. Just think it. All right? What were you doing at 13? Now, to give you also some perspective of this, on the front row over here is my eldest daughter, Emma. In February, she'll turn 12. You with me? Okay? That, that's roughly how old Mary was. 
you with me? She was engaged at that young man age to a man named Joseph, who was likely older than her. And, and before we kind of jump into and start kind of dissecting whether or not that was a good practice or a bad practice, let me just kind of tell you, it was very common in this day and age, as the life expectancy of people living in first century Palestine was kind of lower than it is uh, than the 78.8 years that we live here in the United States today. And so if girls did not get engaged and did not get married at an early age, simply the propagation of your country couldn't continue. You, you couldn't keep up with the death rate and you would decline and die as a nation. So this was a, out of necessity that these women would get married so young and, and begin to have children so young. That was kind of a part of what was going on. And in the night one time, an angel shows up to this young girl, and he says to her, hey, uh, you're going to have a baby. Now, her response, as would probably be any of our daughters' response, is, hey, I don't know how that's going to happen because I've been told that things have to happen before babies can happen, and those things haven't happened. You tracking with me? Did I handle that with kid gloves enough? Okay, good. Okay, so this stuff hasn't gone on, and yet and yet, you're telling me I'm going to have a baby. And the angel says this. The angel says, don't worry. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and you will have God's baby. Now, earlier in, 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 earlier, we were upstairs having our meeting with the worship team. We were, we were talking about that. And I was talking with, with uh, Courtney, who was singing this right here. And I'm going to embarrass her daughter for just a minute. But I was like, I was like, Harley, her daughter, is is will be 13 her next birthday. I was like, what if Harley came in and said, Mom, I'm going to have a baby. But don't worry, it's God's baby. I was like, how would you feel if that happened? And Courtney said, it better be an immaculate conception. I'll tell you that but <laughs> Right? I mean, come on. That was the story that she went with. I just want you to understand that. That's the story she went with. It's as unbelievable then as it is now. Like if your child came in and said, I'm having a baby, but don't worry, it's the Holy Spirit's baby, we'd be like, we should probably check you into an institution. We probably, we, but we're not going to tell that story to anyone else. But this young teenager, 13 years old, she... She deals with this in such an amazing way. She says, let it be done to me as you have said. She said it to the angel. It absolutely blows my mind that such a young lady has such poise and faith. Then she, she goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, the wife of Zechariah, who we talked about last week. And, and she shows up, and Elizabeth is there. And Elizabeth is much, much older, and, and, and Mary is much, much young. And, and they get together, and Elizabeth blesses Mary. And I think, I think, don't, don't, don't hold me to this, but I think it's at that moment when Elizabeth passes this blessing upon Mary and kind of gives Mary some insight into what exactly is going on in her that Mary begins to burst forth with song, that Mary begins to kind of wrap her head around what it is God is doing in her. And the only natural response is to sing a song. So Luke chapter 1, <clears throat> I want to read to you what Mary sings, and we're going to start in verse 46. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Stop. See, Mary knew what this baby would cost her. She knew that because of this baby, she was going to have to tell a fiancé that she has not been intimate with that she's having a baby and it's not his. She knew that he, by law, could have her killed. She knew that she would likely be ostracized from her family, rejected by her fiancé, cast out by her community. She knew that what God had done to her and was doing through her was something that was going to isolate her and make her feel alone and lonely. And yet her response is to say, my soul glorifies God and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Now let me tell you why that's such a, a big concept for me and you to try to understand. It's because we really have a hard time giving God glory in good times, much less bad times. You know how I know that? It's because yesterday my wife wanted to go to Paducah to shop for Christmas presents. And everyone else in western Kentucky and Tennessee also decided they wanted to go to Paducah to buy Christmas presents. And the traffic was horrendous. And we went to Sam's and spent three hours there pushing a buggy that looked like a Mack truck loaded down with stuff. 
with people that did not care anyone else was in the world and had lost their ever loving mind. Pe people didn't know how to drive. They didn't know how to walk. They, I'm surprised that they were able to put like both feet in their shoes and well, let's go to the store today. And that's what they did. I just it was it was a, it was absolutely horrendous. And can I just tell you something? While I'm driving around in the car, I'm asking the Spirit of God to teach me and to tell me like how I should be happy and how I should rejoice because I'm in a car that's full of gas and my belly's full of food and I've got my three favorite women in the world with me. They're in the van and we're going and we're with the family. And Christmas music and Jesus is born. And, and yet, nonetheless, I just wanted to honk my horn and say things that were not godly to other people who had lost their mind. They lost their mind. Maybe I should pray for them. I don't know. Like, listen, 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 listen. When the bank account hits zero, when, when, when he says he wants a divorce, when, 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 when you experience loss or great pain in your life, one of the hardest things to do is to look at God and go, I rejoice in what you're doing in me. In fact, it's almost always the opposite. God, why are you doing this? God, what have I done? To deserve this. Mary's perspective is not why me. Mary's perspective is I can't believe it's me. And the entire first half of her song is her being in awe of what God is doing in her. My soul glorifies God and, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Here's why verse 48. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. This is big. Because Mary was, was young, and Mary was poor, and Mary was from the wrong side of the track. She sums it all up and says, I have a humble state. I think about that, and I go, man, isn't that just like God? To use the person you'd least expect to do the most amazing thing. Isn't it just like God to, to use somebody that the world wouldn't look at and say, here's the person that should be the mother of God. God doesn't look at outward appearance, David would tell us, but he looks at, at the heart. And he looked into Mary's heart and he saw beyond her poverty and he saw beyond her youth and he saw beyond all of those things that might disqualify her in our society. And he said, I am going to do a great thing in her. And there's a great message for us in here, and it's this. You ready? This is good. You're never too young. You're never too old. You're never too rich. You're never too poor to be utilized by God. That's awesome. You're never too, in fact, anything. You're never too far. You're never too out there to be utilized by God to advance His kingdom. Mary says, you've looked on me in my humble You've looked past what the world says that I should do. And as a result, she says in second half of verse 48, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. A couple things about this. First of all, she she's saying that the nations are calling me blessed is not her being boastful. It's not being her being a braggart because she tells us the reason they're going to call me blessed is because of what God has done. And you want to know something? The world has called Mary blessed, haven't they? For 2,000 years, right now in the United States of America, there are over 4 million ladies named Mary. And there's over 1.3 million ladies named Maria. You want to get bigger than that? Let's head on down to South America because they're everywhere, right? Because here's the thing. They understand, we understand there was something that was special about Mary and had nothing to do with her youth. It had nothing to do with her poverty. It had nothing to do with her socioeconomic status or the color of her skin. Instead, it had to do with the fact that God said, Shh. All the nations are going to call her blessed because she wasn't too young to be used by God. She wasn't too poor to be used by God. Neither are you. 
song takes a shift. The song takes a shift, and, 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 it, and it, it moves from, from what God has done for Mary, and Mary now begins talking about what God has done and will be doing through the rest of the world. Just in case you get kind of hung up on tenses of verbs, if, if you're that person, um, what Mary is using here is called the prophetic uh, tense, and, it, and what it does is it talks about a future event like it's already happened. Okay? So when, he, when she says he has extended or he is extending, it's, 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 a, it's a future event, but she's using present tense to talk about it. It's called prophetic uh, past or prophetic present or biblical. We can talk about it later. Okay, anyway, verse 50. His mercy, God's mercy, extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. A couple things about this. First of all, she uses this term mercy. This term mercy is a word that I think maybe we don't understand all the way. Mercy is you not getting something you deserve. That's mercy. You not getting something you deserve. So to give the example that I like to give all the time, if you get pulled over on the side of the road for speeding, you have been speeding, you're guilty. There's no getting around the fact that you're guilty. And the cop comes up and he doesn't give you a ticket. He has shown you mercy. If he gives you $100, he's giving you grace. That's giving you something you don't deserve, right? You with me? You might receive mercy from a police officer, probably not grace in that situation. You with me? You with me? Here's the deal. Here's the deal. So, so she's saying God is going to not give you what you deserve. His mercy can be extended to you. And, 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 and in context, what she's talking about is this. Romans chapter 6 tells us that the wages, the penalty of our sin, is death or eternal separation from God. So through what he's doing in Mary, through this child Jesus, he's going to extend mercy, meaning he's not going to dole out what you deserve. You with me? His mercy will extend, and then he continue, she continues on to tell us uh, how, it will, how it will extend. It will extend from gen to those who fear him from generation to generation. Now, this idea of the fear of God, I want to kind of, kind of camp out on just a minute. Because uh, you may remember, like a couple months ago, we did an entire sermon series on fear, and we played the song, I don't want to be afraid. You remember that? We said it all over, uh, time and time and time again. And, and what we told you is, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. And now we're being told that in order to receive God's mercy, it requires a fear of God. What in the world does that mean? This term fear is, is, is maybe better translated uh, reverential trust. Make no mistake about it, there is an afraid fear that's a part of it, but it has more to do with this reverence, trust, this awe. Let me see if I can put it this way. What, what Mary is getting at in her song is this. When we come to the point that we recognize that God is God, and we are not, then we hold God in a place of awe and respect Fear. You with me? You with me? I'll see if I can explain it this way. When, uh, in fact, I still do this. I started to, to say uh, when my girls were younger, but I, I still do this some. Um, th there are times where we'll do like the little chase game around the house. Maybe you played that with your little kids, or they'll go hide or whatever, and then I'll play the big bad monster and I'll come stomping down the down the hall. You know, three, five, four, five, right? And I can remember one time Emma was real little. And, and we were living in Alabama, and I was chasing her down the hallway, and it was very clear that I was going to catch her. There was no way she could get away from me. There was no way she could outrun me. I was bigger. I was stronger. I was faster. I was more maneuverable, whatever it was, than her little toddler legs could take. And you could tell in her face that there's this sense of, oh, my goodness, I'm terrified. Right as I got to her, she was this. I was telling you. Right as I got to her, she was this. Stopped, she turned and she flung herself at me and threw her arms around me. And I held her tight. And she cried and laughed and all of that kind of thing. And I'm thinking, that's, that's it. That's, that's what the Bible talks about when it talks about the fear of God. It's recognizing that He's God and we're not. It's recognizing that He holds the power and we don't. It's recognizing that He holds the cards. And we don't. It's recognizing that we are here to serve him, not vice versa. It's recognizing that he determines what is fair. We don't. It's recognizing what our place is and what his place is. And recognizing that we have but two reactions we can have for God. One is to run from him in fear. Or the other is to turn around and throw our arms around him and say, I'm so terrified, but you are my only hope. 
bad is what he's talking about. And in our society, we've lost this concept of the fear of God. Because we think of God as the happy grandfather in the sky that pays our way out of hell. And who tries to set some rules and boundaries for us, but but they don't really apply to us. And so we pat him on the head like we do Papa at Christmas time. We go, isn't Papa cute and silly? And isn't Papa funny? And don't you love Papa? And I love him. But we don't really hold any respect for him, do we? That is not the biblical example of Jesus. And if that is your God, then you're not worshiping the God of the Bible. What Mary says is that his mercy is extended. He doesn't give you what you deserve to those who fear him, to those who hold him in a sense of awe. Why should we hold him in a sense of awe? Because he is God and we are not. But we live in a society that likes to say we are God. We make the rules. We determine what we do. We just kind of deal with Papa because he paid our way. That's not what Mary says. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation, meaning that it never ends. His mercy will go forever and ever and ever. And in the same way that you're never to whatever to be used by God, you are also never to whatever to be reached by God's mercy. You're not too far gone. You're not too old. You're not too young. You're not too rich. You're not too poor. You're not too sinful. You haven't made too many mistakes. God's mercy is for all who would place Him on the throne over their life. For all who would call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You are not too far to be out of the reach. His mercy is extended to all who would fear Him. Not just Jews. Not just Gentiles, not just men, not just women, not just not just slave owners and slaves. No, to all. He, she goes on, verse 51. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thought. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. Now, it'd be real easy for us, just to be honest, it'd be real easy for us to, to, to kind of to kind of mis misinterpret this text and to start thinking that what he's saying is that if you're rich or if you're well off or if you're a ruler or a king, then somehow God's mercy is not for you and he's ready to dispose of you. Whereas if you're poor or humble, God is going to raise you up. This is one of the things that we struggled with when we went to Ecuador through the mountains because everybody in the mountains of Ecuador where we served at Hayden were poor. They, they didn't have anything. We're talking dirt floors, uh, you know, Tommy's treehouse was nice for the most of their homes that they lived in. And it's just it's just true. That's how it was. And so when we would read passages like that, they were, yes, yes, God's going to lift up the poor. And those that are holding uh, you know, the, their wealth over us, those that are wealthy, they're going to be disposed of. And we, 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 we try to explain that's not exactly what he's saying. You see, what, what he's saying is this. It's a lot easier when we are humble, when we have nothing to rely on God rather than ourselves. Right? Come on, it's a lot easier when, when we have nothing to go to God and go, man, I'm going to worship God, I'm going to pray to God, I'm going to get engaged with God. But the second things start going well, then, then we start to trust in ourselves just a little bit more. Let me give you an example. When your marriage struggles, and you'll come and get counseling, you'll come and talk to the pastor, you'll come to church, you'll go do whatever it is you have to do, you'll spend time praying when things are in trouble, and you ought to do that. I'm not saying you shouldn't. But when your marriage is going well and everything's fine, everything's clicking on all cylinders, we kind of forget about that, don't we? There's a comedian by the name of Mike Baviglia, and, um, and he tells a story uh, in, in one of his stand-up routines. He actually got cancer and in his bladder, and, and they had to remove it, and, and all that was bad. And he, he grew up Catholic, his mom was Catholic, and he tells that story. Makes that humorous as he can, I guess. And then later on, he he finds a, a girl that he wants to go out with, and he's trying to get her to go out with her. He keeps asking her out, and she keeps rejecting him. And he keeps asking her out, and she keeps rejecting him. It's like, oh, still my life. And um, and so at, finally, he says, "I tricked her to going out with me. I invited her to church." He said, "Now I his words, not mine." He said, "I hadn't been to church since the cancer, but it had worked, so I thought I'd give it another." Man, what a great example of how we utilize God when things are not going our way, 
or to get what we want, and the second things start like kind of kind of going in the right direction, we just kind of back off again, don't we? See, here's what Mary is tapping into. Here's what Scripture taps into. When you have nothing, it's easy to turn to God. But when the bank account is full and your belly is full, it's a little bit easier for us to trust in ourselves. And here, here's what happens. When we trust in ourselves, that is idolatry. That is worshiping self rather than worshiping God. That is not just a sin. That is the sin. Idolatry. You with me? Now, what happens is that is that when we begin to worship self and we take God off of the throne, our trust is not in Him. We lose fear of Him and His mercy eludes us because we don't need His mercy, do we? We don't take care of it ourselves. This is why Jesus would say things like, "It is easier, or, or it's, more, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven." He's not saying being rich is bad. He's not saying you shouldn't have money. He's just saying, hey, when the bank account is full, man, it sure is easy to start to start worshiping that bank account. It is worshiping God. And that's what Mary is saying here. He's elevating the humble. <laughs> and those that are in power and those that have, have money and those that have wealth, those that are trusting in themselves, those are individuals that are going to be mistaken. They're going to be silent. You with me? Because Ultimately, ultimately, what Mary wants to get across here is this. The, the point of her song is that you are never to anything to be outside of the reach of God. You're never too poor, you're never too young, you're never too old, you're never too white, you're never too black. You're never too privileged, you're never too humble to approach God. You're never too tall, you're never too short. God's mercy extends to all who He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary brings it home. <laughs> she, she goes back to really what Zechariah had said in last week's sermon. Our God is a God of peace. Our God is a God that has acted and he didn't have to act. He promised Abraham, Isaac, and Never to anything to be you. I promise that you're never to anything to be you. You're never to anything to be outside of the reach of God. For some of you today, that's really, really good news. Some of you all wandered into church today and you're convinced that you're too old. Some of you wandered into church today and you're convinced that there's no way God could use me. I'm well past the prime of my life. Some of you have come to church today because mom and dad drug you. And your thought is, man, I'm way too young to think seriously about what God might do in my life. There's no way God could use me. I'm, I'm, I'm just a child. I haven't graduated from high school. I don't even have a learner's permit. Whatever it is, fill in the blank there. I'm too young. I'm too old. God can't use me. I don't even have a job. There's no way that God's grace could be for me. I'm, I'm too sinful. You don't know what I've done. It's too late for me. If that's you today, I don't give you good news. You're not to anything. You're never too much. bigger than your past. He's bigger than your age. He's bigger than your marital status. He's bigger than your failures. He's bigger than your struggles. He's bigger than anything you could possibly imagine. And you're never too young. You're never too old. You're never too poor. You're never too damaged to be used by God and to find yourself outside of the, of the grace and mercy of God. It just doesn't happen. You believe that. You are too fill in the blank to be used by God. You don't know about my God. That's incredible. Here's, here's what it takes. This, this is true. Here's what it takes. You see, 
when we recognize that, that we're all within the reach of God's mercy, when we recognize that we're all able to be used by God, then, then you know what that does inside of us? It sparks something inside of us, the same thing that it sparked inside of Mary. It should spark something inside of all of us, the same thing it sparked inside of Zechariah. The same thing later it's going to spark inside the heart of Simeon to recognize he has done great things, to recognize this is amazing grace, and to sing a song out of the depths of your heart as a soundtrack to your life. That in spite of my past, in spite of my mistakes, in spite of my age, in spite of my circumstances, God's mercy has been shown. In spite of all of that, They're going to sing and come and win you. You obviously need to do some penance, pray, and do whatever. But, but as a response, what I'd like us to do is just lift up our voices to God as we sing. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my, my cross. You, Jesus, lay down your life that I may be set free. Would you sing those words today from a position, from a position of someone that? of someone who God doesn't.